86% of profits coming from 5%. It isn't about people, it's about the product. And it's not by accident, it is by targeting. So people harmed by gambling are nine times more likely to receive those daily incentives. 15 times more likely to take your own life than if you're uh, not a gambler. One in four people who gamble are substantially higher risk of suffering serious harm. 20% of the population uh, affected by gambling harms, either their own gambling or a loved one. Heavy gambling associated with increased mortality. Again, this thing about um, uh, it's, it's not all gambling. It's half of all gambling addiction in the UK is associated with online casino games. The 500 people dying uh, of, of gambling related suicides. Hello, uh, th thanks for the introduction, Les. Um, when people say things like that about us, it kind of feels an awful lot to live up to. Um, and I think the, the point actually about us is that uh, we're, we're actually just very ordinary people. And to be honest, that is the whole point of, uh, of, of what we do. We're not remarkable in any way. Um, and our story is all too commonplace. Um, I'm, today, I'm, I'm going to do the, the, the opening part of the session, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Gambling With Lives, how, how it was set up, because um, a lot of people have, uh, have, have talked about, well, why isn't there a Gambling With Lives in the States? Why isn't there one in Australia, etc.? So I'll talk just a little bit about um, the development of Gambling With Lives. Um, Liz will then talk a little bit about the work that we actually do at the moment. We're probably known for the campaigning work that we do. Uh, however, actually that's, that's a small part of the, the, the real activities where our resources in Gambling With Lives go. I'll then talk a bit about the industry and I'll, I'll skip through some of that because you know, we've already had two very eloquent uh, presentations um, uh, uh, outlining what this industry is like and what, what harm is. Um, talk a little bit about the campaigning um, and the coalitions uh, of, 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 of reformers. Um, and then also uh, talk a little bit about the white paper, what has been achieved in the UK and hopefully what, what messages there are uh, for, for, for the US in, 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 in the UK experience. I want to start though with um, showing a film of Gambling With Lives Families. This is a film which was uh, uh, done a year after Jack died. Um, he died in November 2017, one year later, and I'll talk about how we got there, but one year later we held an event uh, in the UK Parliament which was attended by, well, it filled the room and we had dozens of MPs and uh, representatives from the House of Lords as well as ordinary people and, and key organisations. This phrase, when the fun stops, stop. When the fun stops, it's too late to stop. Gambling was the root cause and the immediate trigger of his death. It changed him. It changed his psychology. Josh used to gamble online with his phone at night, and he would describe lying on the bed in sweat, shaking, trying not to go back onto the site to gamble. My famous last words saying to him, look, it's only money, nobody's died. I don't think we really got to grips with, with just actually how deep and complex an addiction gambling can be. People die because of drugs overdoses. People die because of alcohol intake, but to take your own life, that is a different place. In, in, in psychologically, it's a different place. My son went into, into the woods 
where he took his life. Every time you play on these electronic games, you will reinforce the addiction. You have been deliberately addicted so that some people can make money out of you. The industry, as far as we can see as families, are grooming the next generation with a whole set of online games. And these are aimed at seven, eight, nine year olds. That's the next generation who are going to be their income generators. And a proportion of these children will die. It needs to be out there, awareness needs to be out there to tell people about gambling, how bad it is, how much it wrecks your life. Get help, get treatment and send the bill to the gambling industry. Suicide is a consequence of this, this kind of addiction. I didn't know that it was gambling and that there was a danger that somebody would die. Our son. We can't let this happen to anybody else. I don't know how many times I've seen that film, um, and it still gets me, it really does. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about where Gambling With Lives came from, um, and, and I, I think that the story of the development of Gambling With Lives will be, I hope, part of the communication of the strength of Gambling With Lives. Um, oh. That slide is going to be up for quite a long time. I'm going to leave that up while, while I talk about development of gambling lives. Those are just some of the young people in the, um, the first families who, 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 who joined Gambling With Lives. Um, and that is ultimately what this is all about. This is the power of Gambling With Lives. You can see the faces, bright, happy, young people ordinary young people. I don't like to use the word normal young people, but they're just people from all walks of life, no other problems uh, affecting them other than just young people growing up. Um, and they are all dead. That's our son Jack over in the, the top left-hand corner, bright, vibrant young man. I'm not going to go through Jack's personal story. Um, that has been well told. Um, and but basically, Jack started gambling as a child in his school dinner hour, going out to the local bookmakers, the local betting shop in, in the UK with his friends, gambling their dinner money, a bit of fun. That's what it was. That's what it was advertised was. It wasn't a, a dangerous activity that, that people were involved with. This was something on our high street. This was bright lights. It was advertised on television. No danger at all there. A bit of fun. When Jack died, we, we, we probably didn't find out about Jack's gambling until probably a year after he had started gambling, which we now, looking back, can see that Jack was already addicted by the time we knew. Addiction isn't something uh, that takes years to happen. Addiction, particularly with these new as they were new modern high-speed machines, is rapid. It's weeks and months, it's not years. You can see all of these are young people and that's still the story of, of, of Gambling With Lives now. When Jack died, uh, which was seven years after he had started gambling, he had not lost the massive amounts of money that, uh, that, that, that make the newspapers. Jack, over the entire course of his life, only lost uh, 30,000. That, now, it's, that's a lot of money, but over seven years, um, it's not a life-changing amount of money. Um, equally, all of these other young people on here, they didn't die in debt. Most of them hadn't lost tens and hundreds of thousands of pounds. What gambling is, is a mental health illness, and that is what destroys lives. It's not people dying because they can no longer afford to live. It's because they will believe they will never be free of gambling addiction. That was absolutely there in Jack's suicide note. Now, we knew that Jack gambled. We know that he'd, he'd been gambling for those seven years. 
there'd been great long periods when he hadn't gambled and he had uh, been lured back into it. All of the free bets, the inducements to gamble again, Jack suffered from that. Um, when Jack died, it was a shock to... I mean, it was obviously a massive shock to us. It was a shock to everybody who knew him. Jack was a bright, vibrant, happy, uh, popular young man, starting out on a career. He was actually teaching English as a foreign language in Hanoi when he died. Um, the world was absolutely ahead of him. He was having a great time. He was planning to go to the Philippines uh, for, for Christmas with, with, with his friends uh, that he'd made out in Hanoi. When he died, I don't think Liz and I had a second thought that we were going to try and keep this quiet, that we were ashamed of, uh, of Jack in any way whatsoever. Actually, what we felt we had was a duty to tell the world what had happened to Jack. At his funeral, there were literally hundreds of young people for whom one of their best friends was there no longer, and they had no understanding why. His friends out in Hanoi, who'd known him for only months, had no understanding why this young man had taken his life. We owed it to them to tell them it wasn't something that they had done or not done. Uh, it was gambling. And when I said at, 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 at his funeral, when I talked about that, there were so many people came up and they said, well, we knew he gambled. We didn't know that was a life-threatening condition. You know, and people blamed themselves. People blamed themselves. It was, we should have known. We should have intervened. We should have done something. And the truth is, Jack felt the same as well. Because he'd been told, we're, we're going to be talking about the responsible gambling model later on this afternoon, I think. Jack had been told, yes, it is your fault. You are weak. You are flawed in some way. So he had taken the ultimate responsibility for solving this problem. Absolutely the wrong decision, obviously, but that was the case. Now, when Jack died, we hadn't heard of gambling suicides. We thought well, this is the only family this had ever happened to. But we, we live in a town in, in, uh, in, in the UK, Sheffield, quite a smallish town. And within uh, a few days or weeks, we were introduced to another family in Sheffield whose son had died uh, six months before Jack. We were also introduced to another family who live in the south west of England whose son had died a month before Jack. So very soon after Jack's death, we were left with this situation of, OK, it isn't us. There's another child in the same city who's died. There's another death a month before. How many deaths are there? And that was our start of our journey. In terms of our backgrounds, um, I'm, I, I, I was a government researcher. I was a head of higher education research. So I went and I got on the internet and just did all the research I could about gambling and, and, and what it was. Liz uh, had, has worked as a, a senior psychotherapist in the National Health Service. So she set about finding out and understanding the mental health uh, issues that were going on. And we were shocked. We were shocked at what we found. And I think we were more shocked about how much was known but was not public. It's, it's all the things of papers hidden in, in, in academic journals. Um, all silence. And we'll talk a little bit about how, how that conspiracy of silence operates to keep us all ignorant. Um, so what, what we actually did was we, 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 we found other families. We, we, and, you know, we, we trawled all of the local press, uh, we, we um, coroners' uh, uh, courts, uh, undertakers. We did a huge amount of work and we identified, and I can't remember the numbers, it's probably 50 or 60 um, deaths over the previous five or seven years. Um, and we tried to contact those families. Now, many of them were traumatised, did not want to be able to face it, were not able to face it, cultural issues of both gambling and suicide. But what we established was a, a group of, it was about 10 families um, for whom their, their child 
had died. We had a meeting uh, in, uh, in, in Birmingham, another town in, in the UK, uh, in, in the August following Jack's death. And I don't think we'll ever forget the time. There we were, sitting in a circle, basically telling the story of our child's death. And it was like hearing the same story ten times over. Bright, vibrant, happy, young people, no other problems in life, and they were now dead. Coming from good families, good backgrounds, not broken families, not, not people who had drugs and alcohol problems. These were just ordinary kids who were dying. And it, it, it started to make us think, well, what do we do about this? I, as I said, had then hit the research and I found a decades of research linking gambling and suicide. Was that ever in the public domain? Of course not. The only time gambling ever got into headlines was when somebody had lost monstrous amounts of money. The stories about how many zeros at the end of what they'd lost. There weren't the stories about deaths. There weren't the stories about uh, young people um, being abused, being dragged into this and, and, and dying. Um, and we came up with this estimate based on a, a small number of studies of completed suicides and came up with an estimate of between 250 and 650 deaths, gambling-rated suicides, in the UK every year, which is between about 5 or 4 and 11 percent. Now, that for, for, for the UK meant so hundreds of people dying every year. What it was, it's one a day, or is it two a day? I mean, it was shocking to, to, to actually dis, you know, discover that, that actually the state did not know how many people gambling was killing every year. There it was regulating away this industry as if it was some normal leisure activity, which was actually killing hundreds of people. Now, if you look in the States, if you have similar sorts of figures here, that's four and a half thousand people dying of gambling-related suicides every year. It's absolutely shocking. So, we... That, that year, we, we, we held our first parliamentary event. Um, and I think that, that what was the power of Gambling With Lives was, first of all, actually just revealing that figure, 250 to 650 deaths per year. Liz and I, in that first year, had dozens of meetings with regulators, politicians, charities working in that area. And we were kind of met almost by this blankness of, really, that number? You know, just didn't know it. Which is extraordinary, given that there is that literature there. But what Gambling With Lives did was bring death to the debate about gambling regulation. It wasn't about the other people losing a lot of money. It was about death. What we also brought was the fact of the we were, we are, ordinary people. The young people who are dying were ordinary people. There's been the mythology, and it's actually been touched on a bit today already, is that somehow people who gamble and get gambling addiction, are somehow they're the other. You know, they're, they're from a different class, they're from a different area, they're from a different upbringing, they're a different race, they're a different, you know, that there is something about them and that has been an incredibly important narrative for the gambling industry. Um, and what Gambling With Lives did is it challenged that absolutely head on. These are the people who are dying. And you tell, you tell me, you tell Chris's mum, Daniel's mum, Kimberly's mum, you tell them that their child was somehow weak, flawed, bad upbringing, etc. It's just nonsense. And that is what politicians and regulators could see. It was starting, it was challenging the very basics of, of how they think about gambling addiction. And I think that what we also did was actually gave 
permission's the wrong word. We enabled uh, people who were gamblers in recovery to also be able to speak. It's a, it's a pretty brave thing for a, a gambler in recovery to actually challenge this notion, it's not my fault, okay, I've, you know, it's my role to, to get well again, but in terms of being given the addiction, it's actually the industry, it's the products. What we were able to help, I think, is to say, yeah, these are normal people who have died, these are normal people who are addicted. Now, I think there are, you know, before we were on the scene, there were still many, many brave individuals, and Matt is indeed one of them, who had stood up and said, yeah, I've had major gambling addiction problems, and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not the bad person in this, that we need to shine the spotlight on who is the real villain in this, i.e. the gambling industry. And... And I think that that has, has been a really important thing, is that the more that we've allowed or helped or whatever, more people to be able to stand up and tell their story. The stories that, that John had talked about there, of these, these, these very ordinary uh, law-abiding citizens who go and uh, commit the most dreadful and ridiculous crimes. Again, in the recovery community, there are so many people like that who've lived a life of... 20, 30 years being responsible citizens and then, because of their gambling addiction, committing some extraordinary crime, usually fraud. Um, people who in any other time, if, if they had not come across gambling, if they had not been given this addiction, would have carried on living very productive, normal um, lives, citizens, you know, great citizens in, of the community. So, again, in terms of gambling lives, what we think we did then is we, we brought that new evidence. We brought that, that understanding of, of, of how gambling addiction does happen to, to ordinary people. We did put the focus on, on, on products. Um, but we have also, also always used evidence. We've been very evidence-based. Evidence of lived experience is incredibly important. It's incredibly powerful. But it is important to understand the literature as well. So we have always, um, when we're making government submissions uh, to, to the whole sets of various consultations, we do talk about um, the lived experience position, but uh, we, we also um, talk about the, the, this, this wider uh, evidence. I'm going to hand over to Liz in a second just to talk about what Gambling With Lives does now because, as I say, we do do the campaigning work. It is important. It has been impactful. Um, but actually, where we started at was meeting these people and kind of being mutual support, understanding each other, helping each other. And that is still an incredibly important part of, of, of what Gambling With Lives does. Um, before I hand over to Liz, I'd, I'd just say that something, again, characterising um, gambling with lives is seeing lived experience as being more than just our stories. We had full lives before Jack died. We had our knowledge and understanding from the lives that we had lived. We didn't overnight suddenly become the parents of this single tragic story and that that is what we had to offer in, 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 in terms of making change happen. And so we have always been really strong advocates of, yes, we lived experience, yes, we do tell those stories, yes, we have insight from that, but that is the point that we have insights which actually people who haven't been through this don't have. You can have the empathy... You can have a level of understanding, but the insight that lived experience provides is, 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 is absolutely enormous and, and, and vital. And that, I think, again, is, is core to, the, to, to our campaigning work, is, is using that lived experience, but placing it in the context of that wider understanding and knowledge. Um, we've we've learned, uh, Matt was really kind in saying Gambling with Lives as being an incredibly important 
uh, campaigning organisation. We've learnt a huge amount from Matt. We met, met, met Matt within months of Jack dying and talking to him, getting his level of understanding of how this industry operates, that initial understanding of products was so important. And so I think that is absolutely key is, again, Gamble with Lives is that combination of lived experience but that wider knowledge. I'm going to hand over to Liz and then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about, about the industry, which will be maybe repeating some of the stuff which has already been said. But again, I hope that we'll, we'll have a look at it slightly just in the context of, um, of, of through the lens of lived experience. I just wanted to say uh, then a little bit about the, 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 the campaigning side of the work that, that Gamble with Lives does. Um, First of all, really, it's just, you know, um, and, and this statistic has been uh, quoted already by Matt. Um, and, and I think that this, 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 as a single slide, says what is wrong with this industry. 80, this is for online betting. 86% of profits coming from 5%. Um, I think there's, that was a really interesting question as to whether the gambling industry, looking like it does, can be reformed because you have to have a very very different business model to that this is about exploiting addiction um, like, like, uh, like you say over here you have a very wide coalition of, of, of people fighting for gambling reform the same is absolutely the case in the UK um, and one of the greatest advocates for, for reform is actually Sir Ian Duncan Smith, who's an ex-leader of the Conservative Party. So um, I guess the closest uh, the Republicans uh, over here. And he, you know, he's as free marketer uh, an MP as you could ever get. Ian Duncan Smith says that he has never seen an industry like this. It's not an industry that builds up a lifetime relationship uh, with its customers, that it's, you know, it's selling a car and you sell one every five years and you service in between, etc., etc. You develop that and that is how your business operates. This is a, a, a business which gets people drawn in gets them to lose as much money or to, to they take as much money off them as quickly as possible. Now, meanwhile, you're ruining that person's life, you're bankrupting them or you're killing them. Um, so what you're doing is you are generating that next generation of ad addicts. And that is why you have this massive marketing side of, uh, of, of the industry. Um, uh, just a few of the other stats and again I think for campaigning for me one of the important things is keeping things simple you know that as a statistic you might forget the exact numbers but that as a message is absolutely core and it just needs to be repeated again and again again actually this has been mentioned already today this is why and it's because it isn't about people it's about the products uh, again, we've touched on the, this, this homogenisation as if all gambling is the same, uh, uh, playing the lottery is the same as uh, playing a high-speed addictive game. It isn't. That is what the industry has successfully done hidden behind in the UK. Um, it's kind of this strange alliance at the moment in terms of the horse racing industry somehow being allied with the casino industry. They, they do operate in very, very different ways, but at the moment they are fighting reform as if they're all one happy family. I think that one of, one of the, the, the successes, Matt would probably know it better than me, of the Fobtees campaign was actually there were divisions within the gambling industry of the people who benefited from Fobtees and then those who actually didn't, because if you're betting on Fobtees, you're not betting on horses, etc. So that whole thing of there are some products which are just really too addictive to be on the market in the truth. And it's not by accident. It is by targeting. So people harmed by gambling are nine times more likely to receive those daily incentives. It's not just the random thing of you have an account and therefore you'll get the offers of free bets occasionally. Matt was touching on the amount of data that the gambling industry holds. They know who are their good customers, i.e. their big losing customers, and they target them. And if those people stop gambling for a while, they get the uh, inducements to come, come back again. 
it's uh, you know, actually the online industry. In truth, there shouldn't be any harm. There is such incredible data on the gambling of individuals that the industry, should it want to, could intervene before harm starts happening. It doesn't get used that way. It gets used to target. It gets used to drag people back in to get them to be that 5% who will be producing all that profit. And the inevitable consequence of this is death. Yes, there's all the bankruptcy side of things as well, um, but obviously for Gambling With Lives, this is the sort of statistic that we look at. 15 times more likely to take your own life than if you're uh, not a gambler, people with uh, gambling disorder. And that's why we have the 250 to 650 deaths per year. And I actually just ought to say on that, when we produced those figures, it was kind of people almost didn't believe it. This, this cannot be happening underneath our noses. Last October, I think it was, Public Health England finally produced their own estimate of deaths. And they came up with a, a very accurate figure, they think, of 409 gamma-rated suicides in England alone. So slap bang in the middle of our, our range. That has been, was challenged, of course, by industry and their lobbyists. Um, the figure has been reviewed by the, uh, uh, the, the replacement of PHE. They've come up with exactly the same set of estimates. So it's actually up to 500 deaths in England alone each year. Um, I'll skip through this, but, but it's, this, is, this is kind of the, 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 the summary of, um, of the, you know, the common thing of, of the industry saying, well, there's only a few people. It's not. It's, it's, we were touched on the figures uh, earlier on this morning. Study done by uh, Oxford and Warwick University found that one in four people who gamble are substantially higher at risk of suffering serious harm. It's not this little fraction of one, it's one in four people who are gambling are at that high risk. 20% of the population are affected by gambling harms, either their own gambling or a loved one. It's probably even higher than that, actually, if, if, you, if you look at the impact across uh, impacts on productivity within business, etc., for instance. So, you know, this heavy gambling associated with increased mortality, Again, this thing about um, uh, it's, it's not all gambling. It's half of all gambling addiction in the UK is associated with online casino games. The only reason we don't have this massive public health crisis is that fortunately at the moment, relatively few people play these appalling games. But that is changing. That's changing with the mobile phone. That's changing with young people and being targeted. And, and also with the growth of in-game sports betting, which was touched on this morning. And then, then the 500 people dying uh, of, of gambling-related suicides. I'm going to cut some of these. Um, again, touched on how does the industry manage uh, to, to, to keep below the radar, to keep all this harm hidden. First of all, we've got the good old things of corruption. Um, in the UK... It's only two weeks ago, this uh, Conservative MP, Scott Benton, was caught in a sting by uh, the Times newspaper. Um, and th they were posing as a gambling company, basically saying, well, how much would it cost for you to uh, cost us for you to you know, lobby for us in Parliament? And what he said was a real expose of what lobbying is about. He was telling stories about how you know, he could sit outside the Secretary of State's door uh, making sure you got questions. When it came to the vote, he could be next to the Secretary of State and would follow them round talking for 10 minutes. It was absolutely shocking. It was a real expose. And there have been lots of other um, uh, uh, investigations showing actually just how much the gambling industry courts MPs giving them their free gifts, uh, trips to Ascot, etc., etc. Second side of things is that, that funding research, keeping, keeping that agenda uh, close to them. Um, at the moment, uh, or, or historically, the vast majority of gambling research has been either directly or indirectly funded by the industry. John touched on this this morning. Very glossy looking reports. Are they of any value at all? 
one of the great uh, uh, myths that the gambling industry in the UK uh, is, is peddling to um, resist reform is to say, well, if you, re if you start to reform this industry and start to regulate it properly, everyone will go to the black market. So they commissioned a report from a company, perfectly uh, legit company, PwC, trying to indicate what the impact would be. Now, actually, in the UK, the, 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 the black market is vanishingly small, partly because it's such a loosely regulated industry that why would you ever bother going onto a, a black market site anyway? But, the, but the <laughs> actually reading the disclaimer from PwC in this report was a wonder in itself. I should have put that up there. But it was basically sort of saying... Um, this shouldn't be used for um, policy, informing policy making. You know, they were distancing themselves from this stuff. And then this whole other thing, which I won't say much about now because I know there's another session on, on responsible gambling, but that whole myth which the gambling industry has successfully sold year after year as it's the fault of the individuals. It's not our, it's not our products. Um, I'll go past those because we'll touch on those. Um, I'll perhaps uh, miss out on that. I will just sort of then talk about um, the range of campaigning activity that there is in the UK, of which GWL is just one part. And, and I think something that Liz and I often find really difficult is that we are held up as being, you know, it's, uh, it's gambling with lives, or even worse, it, it's Liz and Charles Ritchie. It's not. We are a tiny, tiny part of this amazing coalition of people who have seen the light. I mean, we talk in many respects with, with one voice, not because we're meeting all the time and working out what our strategies are. It's because there is a truth here. There's some pretty simple information that once you look at it, there is only one conclusion. But it, it, it is an amazing coalition of, 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 of different people. We've got on there, in fact, you'll see Matt in, in the corner there. I always think these look like mug shots when there are people there saying I support the work of. But So that was Matt at one of our parliamentary events. We've then got to sets of politicians. So Ian Duncan Smith, Ronnie Cowan uh, and uh, Carolyn Harris and our own MP, uh, Paul, Paul Blomfield. Um, there has been a really strong um, movement of politicians to move this agenda forward. And, 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 and you've got Carolyn, who's a Labour MP, Ian Duncan Smith, uh, Conservative, and Ronnie, Ronnie Cowan from the Scottish National Party. So it's across the whole base. We also have uh, clinicians involved. Matt Gaskell, Henrietta Bowden-Jones, who are probably the two preeminent uh, gambling clinicians in, in the UK, both have spoken out very boldly and, and, and have advocated for reform. They have told the truth, and that's incredibly powerful to have you know, the top clinicians telling the same story as just simple lived experience. Um, there's plainly the families, individual family members. Um, and then uh, Liz briefly mentioned the big step, and that, that in some respects is a bit of a coalition between uh, bereaved families, but also gamblers in recovery, and very much focusing on football. Football is, is, you know, the soccer is the national support sport in, in the UK and the gambling industry really is using it as, as the gateway uh, to, to, to get young people in. And, and then I want to mention uh, the, a whole range of academics as well, so people like James Noyes who've written, again, some very authoritative papers which, again, back up uh, the sorts of things that we, we end up saying. Let me, let me just show this. What I'll miss out then is, and we, you know, we, can, we can come back and sort of twist one of our future <laughs> sessions to perhaps talk a little bit more about the white paper. But I, I do want to say, um, because I think in terms of reform in the States, is the engagement of key politicians. Um, I've, I've already talked about the, the, the politicians who, um, who, 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 who've been incredibly important in the um, campaigning. However, there are politicians who at one time or another are more important than others. And in the UK, it's the secretaries of state for that government department or the minister in charge of gambling. And this is one of the things which I, I think is quite extraordinary, I always find, is the, the reliance and the randomness in some respect of who is in power at the time. I want to just point out three particular ministers. Tracy Crouch 
who was the minister who oversaw the change to the fixed odds betting terminals uh, uh, stake reduction. Very uh, committed, brave decision. She actually resigned her post to make sure that that legislation went through. If it had been another minister in post, who knows what would have happened. I want to mention Chris Philp as well, who I think, uh, again, absolutely free market uh, Tory MP, but who was the minister in charge of gambling review during its, its most important period. Chris, I think, came to, to this position of, 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 uh, of, of gambling, like so many politicians, really not knowing very much about it. You have to go out and tell politicians there. But he was a very serious politician. He took the review very serious. He was very evidence-based, and he came up with what is effectively pretty much in the white paper. And I'd also like to, to highlight uh, Lucy Fraser, who is the current Secretary of State. Through a whole load of, uh, of, of, of non-gambling related uh, issues, the gambling white paper has been delayed and delayed and delayed in the UK. Um, Lucy Fraser was, was the, the last incumbent to land in the chair about two and a half months ago. And I think genuinely she was embarrassed about the performance of the government of, of, of the fact that this, this review, which should have reported really within a year, had taken two and a half years. She got that out and that, that, that was uh, literally yesterday, if I, if I can get the, the timings right of different uh, countries and things. So, you know, and again, she took it very seriously. She's a KC, a King's Counsel, so she's a, you know, one of the top lawyers. Um, and, and, and so, uh, again, you do have to rely on politicians in power. I invite any questions from the audience right now. The Richards will be here all this the next day and a half as well. So if anything you want to get into a longer conversation, you know, doing it at a dinner or something might be a better too. But any, any immediate questions for, for um, Liz and Charles? Gene. I just wanted to say, I know that Liz and I had a conversation last night. I just, I wanted to share with you that I never really understood the mental health side of it until you started talking about that. So I'm very grateful for both of you for opening up another thing, another side that I have never seen as Moms Against Gambling. How do you find the signs? How do you find the people? That's, that's you know, how can we help to find that? Um, people often ask that. And I'm not sure it's about how we find the signs. There are, there are definitely indicators. I'm actually on the, um, the what's called the NICE committee, which is reviewing um, um, therapeutic interventions for, for gambling addiction at the moment. So we've been talking a lot about that. So indi what are indicators? The best indicator is playing on dangerous games. So it's not just about seeing if somebody's restless or has insomnia, that would be a very classic symptom. So you've got symptoms, you could say, um, anxiety. I'm not sure it's always depression. Um, it's depression if you try and talk and are not understood, but anxiety and insomnia are more symptoms, you could say. The best possible indicator is um, engaging with casino games, online casino games. So the first question should be for any health, uh, a health professional, um, what are you gambling on? How much? You know, with alcohol, for example, we would say, what are you drinking? We wouldn't say, uh, you know, you're drinking a pint of, uh, a whole bottle of scotch each day, would be the same as having a half of lager. We wouldn't say that. If, if it was drugs, we, we wouldn't say smoking a, a little bit of marijuana would be the same as taking heroin all the time. It's, you know, we, we have to look at the products. That's the best indicator. Thank you. John Kent. Uh, <clears throat> that was really excellent. Thank you for that presentation. And uh, uh, we've been using the numbers uh, that you've been coming up with in England, which in some areas extrapolates from what we've done here in the United States. Thank you very much for that. If you get major legislation through, um, please uh, coordinate through us. 
with us and vice versa because when that happens that is a persuasive argument on the international scale for our decision makers here in the United States so thanks for everything that you're doing and, and one last thing how much of this can you get on Google on YouTube um, and distributed uh, if you could address that because people need to know this yeah um I, I think it would be quite nice if we could manage to construct a little uh, session whereby we do talk about what has happened uh, in, in the white paper because there are some good things in that and there are some gaping holes and I think it would be useful to kind of think about what is the learning from that. In terms of availability of materials, um, pretty much everything up there is actually on the Gambling with Lives website. So we, 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 we have been an organisation which is very much lived experience and professional and using the research. So, so we do have research reports on there, which are, tend to be summaries rather than original research. And then we have a kind of a key facts page as well. So um, certainly a visit to the Gambling with Lives website, I think, is, uh, is always a good thing. And thank you for your comments, John. One last question, Pat. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you for your presentation and how important it is, because in the past, in Nebraska, we have paid a lot of money to have market research as to what would influence voters and what would influence uh, uh, politicians. And in both of those surveys, it came back, it was personal story. That that's what is going to influence and change the minds of voters and politicians. So um, I think, you know, we just need to use that more often. You can give them lots of facts and lots of figures and lots of economy, um, but it's the personal stories that actually change the minds. Very, very, very briefly. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think what we always guard against is just being stories that we we know that we've got more to add than that. But you're absolutely right. A, a page of statistics can be very dry. I, th I think it's 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 really interesting that that uh, Matt and we have kind of commissioned a whole range of uh, just surveys about public attitudes, and there is overwhelming support for major uh, reform of gambling. And part of it is increasingly everybody knows somebody who has had a problem it's you know the, every time we go to events you know somebody will come up and say my brother my uncle my whatever you know and so the the real life stories people are connecting with as well that they they, they see it very much happening next door thank you and you know and that's why we call this america's most neglected problem that same activity is occurring here yeah uh, well, all this, real quick Andrew, yeah go ahead real quick you mentioned that you were just one voice among many in your presentation, which I think is excellent, that we're all working together. Can you name, uh, help us identify and connect with other groups that are the, the good players we should be working with? We always share, <laughs> share the mic. I, I think that's true. I think there aren't that many voices that aren't funded by the industry, if I'm really truly honest about that. I mean, there are other voices. I would say there are, there, there's a band of individuals, put it that way, and I think that's really what you meant in terms of that, and people who've been campaigning for years before we, we started. And it's always about saying, you know, it's not just us, it's, it is a number of people. Um, but there are significant groups who have been funded by the gambling industry who do um, promote the responsible gambling model unfortunately. And that, and I have to be honest, 90% of the treatment in the UK at the moment is funded by these groups. So most treatment is not evidence-based and is done within an idea that actually it's about an individual taking responsibility, having got addicted in the first place. And I was differentiated between the getting addicted and actually taking responsibility for your own healing which is different, but they, it's very noticeable that this, they don't put the statistics or name the product. That's great. Thank you so much.